Well, just like that, that is the last day that Jesse and myself have to get up at 2 in the morning to start watching these games for the 6th Sweden Major. And instead, starting tomorrow, we only have to get up at what? Like 8 a.m. or something? Like it's Yeah, 8.30, I think. That's a, that's a damn Cruising. fine difference by comparison to how early we've had to do it this time, which is very helpful for ESL and for Ubisoft for doing a little bit of time adjustment for us so it's not as brutal. But what is as brutal, and the thing that we now need to acknowledge today, is that Regrettably, the dream is now dead, now and forevermore. No possibility of a comeback. Start your near airport memes because this is where they will go to die. It's the last time we have to talk about it. SSG is now dead to me. Welcome back to the post show, everybody. <laughs> you didn't even put your shirt on. You didn't put your SSG merch no, like, on your body. No, why would I put it on? I can't. They're gone. There's no reason to Because you're a fanboy, Jacob. I am. This is true. I just put a different T-shirt on. I put a band T-shirt on because I'm I'm rebellious like that huh i'm I, I admittedly like this was the prediction that i had the least amount of faith in overall was whether they were going uh -huh. to defeat nip like i thought it could be a 2-1 in the same way that i figured that the phase bds game was also probably going to be a 2-1 but everything today was 2-0s we didn't have a map three which on production's end i'm kind of grateful for because it would have <laughs> meant they had like a 15 to 16 hour broadcast overall if games went super long uh for their sake i'm happy it didn't happen but we got a whole bunch of short games which means we didn't have a whole bunch of time to prepare for stuff today so uh this is literally as good of a day as the caster talent could have had because you, you remember from mexico we're just like the faster this day is over the happier we will be collectively <laughs> i mean that's what it's like working a land sometimes right especially yeah. when there's no crowd to like fuel you up and everything it can be uh it can be kind of draining for the casters and for the players as well but uh, i am happy that we at least got a lot of close maps like we only got eight but i want to say that like oh, we get a seven five eight six seven five eight seven seven uh, eight seven and an eight six and then two like kind of lopsided maps so like that's a yeah. really competitive day even though we only had two of's one of them was uh what the seven one for uh sandbox and damn one and the other one was what was the other one seven Not three sandbox. phase bds oh yeah yeah seven one damn one uh sandbox yeah and seven three phase bds well done sounds about right uh that was the one thing I was capable of doing today uh, in the midst of me not being able to take very effective notes or clip very many things for the post show was remember what the map scores were just because uh, I, we had like that whole rest day at like, oh, like got some rest, but I did nothing but sleep and then tried to go <laughs> into today thinking it was going to be fine. My body on CEST simply does not work very well. So uh, we'll go back and wait for that. But before we jump into how these games went down, I do wonder, do we have a bracket graphic all set to go? Because I do want to talk about the way that everything transpired, like today specifically. We can kind of like talk about like our predictions heading into all of these games and uh, get a general sense of where our heads were at or kind of what our logic was. Here it is. So nip space station was the last game of the day so we can kind of start from the ones that we began the day with which was dom Juan kia and sandbox gaming which for me this looked like a dom Juan kia map or a series the whole way through i had more confidence in them they were the winners of the group of death i th there was every reason to be hype around these guys mostly because rain and yas are turning themselves into household names internationally again because they got a little bit of a spotlight in mexico but now they're turning it into something legitimate which is really dope to see and for sandbox they almost have like an anti apac style and they went back to a map that they had played three times over the course of groups and they just got run over by rin uh given the instruction smash and he smashed incredibly well so what do we think about that one yeah this is one that i think on your show i predicted damn one and then i flipped it like on thursday when i on Thursday, I went through my notes, right? And that was, I think, the one prediction I changed was I went uh, from Dam 1 over to Sandbox. I just felt yeah. like the games that I watched, I thought Sandbox was playing better uh, in their in their group stage than what I saw from Dam 1. But uh, you know what? It is what it is. Uh, very close <laughs> series, uh, as we mentioned, at least on that, you know, one map. But um, yeah, I think for this map, like overall, the battle of the Korean teams, it did kind of show up where like Dam 1 Kia are the team that we've seen thrive under pressure right play really well when everything's on the line as you mentioned yas and rin can pop off and i believe one of my notes for this game yeah my notes for coastline is just r i n and that's like you know, <laughs> that's basically yep. what it was um so so they really had like a great time uh and sandbox you know this is a team that has kind of done they've had more opportunities to show themselves right internationally they've been around forever and because of that they've experienced this pressure before but it's almost like they don't do anywhere near as well uh, under this pressure 
as what we've seen from Damwon in just their two land experiences so far, right? So I think it definitely got to Damwon, particularly after losing that first map, 8-7. Um, things really spiraled from there. There was one fun fact about this one. The, the last time, not counting a Pro League final, that we had two APAC teams meet one another in a quarterfinal, we're hearkening back to the SI 2019 days, and it was Fnatic Nororengo had the exact same scoreline as this series, 8-6-7-1. Nora Rengo, which I I wow. looked at that and like this is this is meant to be this is crazy <laughs> this this was the year that this was uh for a long time this was the furthest that any APAC team had ever managed to go because it was this game because Nora Rengo went to the semifinals and got beats uh was it by Empire or G2 for for that year to go to the grand final it was it was obviously one of those two but I, I offhand don't remember what the matchup was and then the other time was at the uh, Milan finals in season nine, whereas Fnatic Nora Rengo again in the quarterfinals, and that's where Fnatic won. But I think both of those games were OT. So this is still the furthest that any APAC team has managed to go. So if they can get to a grand final, that will automatically make Dom Juan Kia the single greatest APAC team that has ever existed in terms of their longevity in a major or premier tournament bracket. And if it, honestly, at this point, I would love it if they could get there, but they got to play phase, and that's a whole other ball game. Yeah, I mean, I think they've already cemented themselves. I would say that Damwon and Kia are the strongest team that APAC has ever sent to an event. Um, they look so good right now. It didn't take and, them long uh, to turn their fortunes around after being, like, like, like honed in on their own region because of COVID for a long time, right? And, like, struggling yeah. because they couldn't do anything internationally for a bit. This turnaround, to me, is insane. Yeah, and I mean, it didn't take them long to, like, even show up and figure things out. Like, this team didn't exist a few months ago, Jacob. A year ago, this yeah. team was literally non-existent. And again, you compare that to Sandbox, where the very first season that Korea had a league, this team was there, and they had a large majority of the same players. Two of the same players, and their current coach was on that team. So, like... <laughs> the difference in storylines is ridiculous. Their play styles also kind of mimic that, right? The difference in, uh, in the way that they like to play. So, it's been... Uh, it's been very fun to watch that Korean rivalry. And I know a lot of people were upset that these two teams actually like met in the quarterfinals. Yeah. But I'm happy about it, dude. Because it's okay. The worst thing that could happen is two regions meeting in the grand finals. Meeting in the quarterfinals, although it kind of is like, you know, one of them's got to go home, it does launch one of them forward to an even more pressure event. And I think that can be a lot of fun just seeing these two teams finally clash on the highest level definitively get an answer of who's on top in korea yeah so uh, we'll get into it more once we touch on that matchup but the that that style clash is one that i think is really really interesting and i was sad that the last map went to a 7-1 and wasn't any closer but that's something we can look at in a second i do want to move to what we had for a second game of the day because i do notice one mr aces in chat so we might as well confront our demons early and talk about how we we may or may not have picked rogue to to make it out of quarterfinals but they did over the reigning six major champions no one saw this coming right right like no 90 percent of people had team one getting out of this yeah this was like this should have been like on paper this was like the most one-sided match and like if aces is here you know i'm sorry to say it but like <laughs> i had zero faith right i was all on board the team one train i saw them in mexico i saw them play their groups they looked really really strong rogue you know i, I maybe maybe a uh Maybe my expectations were on point, and I'll, I'll defend that, but I maybe I should apologize a little bit because we did say that, like, their group was kind of easy, and that's the only reason they got through. That might have <laughs> been something that somebody like me might have said one at one point in time. Clip um, but they stepped up this game, you know, and they really did play fantastic Siege against Team 1. This was the match where uh, they proved me and, and many other people wrong. Alongside with this victory, the semifinals is cool, it's nice, but they also locked down the sixth invitational, which Sheesh. I think is the bigger deal. Um, because they, you know, were very unsure if they were gonna get there, right? It seemed like it was gonna be TSM. They had to make it all the way to the semis. Their odds of doing so uh, at the start of the tournament were were not great, um, to say <laughs> the least, but they pulled it off and uh yeah, they can hold their head up high, even if they get 7 0 7 0 by NIP. I think they can be very happy with how they played and what they've earned by winning that game yeah this is probably i mean th this is them breaking the curse we said if they make it out of groups that's cool but the next step is winning quarterfinals because that's where uh this team even though there's been a number of orc changes and player shifts over the course of the past two years since about tokaname that was where they were always kind of hitting a wall and even though i think the only player remaining on this team from tokaname happens to be aces at this point they still did it 
there isn't that curse hanging over their head because it was a thing that uh, when like started when they were with giants and then finally when the rogue acquisition came up rogue as an org kind of inherited that i think and it's just like it, it, it's almost like if you buy a car but the, the car isn't completely paid off when you've purchased it you still have business to take care of that was kind of my, my philosophy around rogue for a bit and they did and i'm super super happy for the guys especially with the way that both aces and prono played that game prono is looking like one of the single greatest pickups probably in most of this year maybe even next to the hot and cold acquisition for what he's contributing to this roster so super super happy for the guys Team one looked super, super lackluster, and I'm not, uh, I'm not certain oh where, where they fo fell off the wagon, other than the fact that KDS looked like he just didn't show up in that series to begin with. Um, without getting super specific, that was one thing I noticed initially. Yeah, I mean, we'll dive into it more, but I was just like, I'm a, I'm a player, right? I'm a person, I'm an analyst that really despises IQ. I think she 99% <laughs> of the time doesn't bring enough value to a team. You know, having those explosives can be so important. I think IQ so often lets a team down when they could be bringing something like a Yana or a Finca or Zofia. But oh my god, Team 1, why didn't you bring an IQ for even a single <laughs> round, dude? Just one round would have been fine. They called the tack timeout and the coach wasn't like, you know, maybe somebody should try IQ. They went for Nook before they went for IQ. I just, oh, that one was frustrating to watch. Um, and Team 1, I don't know, man. Those there was a there was a lot of Valk cams on that map. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, what there was there was some Echo played. I want to say I, I don't remember if it yeah, was. Yeah, there was. It, it wasn't like definitely was. It wasn't as substantial as the Valk play, and that's something I do want to touch on in a minute. So before we spoil ourselves on it, uh, we'll go ahead and jump series real quick. Phase BDS. Uh, kill me, just just kill me on this one. I hate being right. This is an example of me hating that i was correct on something because i did want bds to go through and to come in with a coach presumably with a little bit of a buff like having something in your back line and your support staff that didn't exist in mexico when you were one round away from grand finals in mexico and now having a worse showing this isn't really a case where like when you have a, a new player come in and everyone is kind of like okay so whatever you were doing whether it was good or bad before now it's a question mark we have a lot of things that need to kind of get answered and figured out over the course of like three months or so and even then like you're not proven to be a legitimate team until a, like a considerable amount of time after our roster transfer like that this is adding a coach and the team is already doing good but somehow fundamentally they aren't the same team anymore and i don't get why when they were undefeated in the eul with bios behind them and now they're out a, a whole other round in sweden before they were in mexico why I mean, I'll, I'll say it again. They got screwed by the bracket, and that's not me dunking on the format. I mean, to be to be perfectly clear, they screwed themselves in the bracket, losing that game to NIP, uh, you know, in the in the group stage, basically locked them into this matchup where they had to play Phase Clan in the first round. And in my opinion, Phase Clan still look like the favorites to win this entire event. You know, BDS have been owed an event, it feels like, forever because they have been so good for so long. And you, yeah. you see Europe is this region that, like, produces super teams, right? Obviously, there was Penta and then G2, right? Then they produced Empire. And then BDS, well, there, there was, like, Navi for, like, a tournament. But then there was BDS, right? That's, like, the next evolution of, like, Europe's most dominant, powerful team. And BDS just never won anything, at least so far. I mean... Yeah. There, there's SI and many more tournaments to come, but this, I think everybody had kind of pegged as like probably the toughest quarterfinal matchup you could be in. And, um, you know, at least in that second map, I think they really played their hearts out, but it just wasn't enough. Phase Clan, <sighs> Ladam Supremacy, Jacob. Uh, but this Phase Clan is one that looks so much better, and it's. You, you, you talked about BDS being a team that kind of seemed like they were owed an event. To be fair, FaZe Clan, for having sponsored a team for as long as they have not winning a tournament, yep. has been kind of atrocious. So this result is one that I'm I'm still okay with because if there's anybody that I do want to see win something uh, in a premier environment that isn't like a BR6 final is cameraman and astro that's like these guys have been my favorite latin american team since i started following the scene uh because I, I i looked at what they had to offer and they always seemed like they were a team on the cusp of greatness they were very much like the the whole tsm 2020 storyline but for way way longer and then had a really big fall off this year and i was concerned that that kind of might be the end of it almost to a point where i didn't know how much longer phase wanted to keep on supporting this team but they're, they, they look way better and i I do want this kind of uh, chance that they took on getting another analyst 
having an entire team shuffle up with Astro having four of his teammates leave and have four more come in. I did want this chance to pay off because everyone knew that it was going to be a long-term thing. There wasn't a general expectation of MIBR getting bought out by FaZe and having instant success. Like, I didn't really think that that was going to happen. And now it's looking like they're on a path to win. All they have to do is beat Damwon, and then I think they're probably home free, regardless of who they end up meeting from the other semifinal. This is still legitimately FaZe's tournament to win. I had them winning the whole thing, and I did think whoever won FaZe BDS was probably going to end up winning this whole tournament. Yeah, you and I both ended up making that claim, um, and I really think that, uh, you know, that was the strongest uh, quarterfinal matchup, and we should see FaZe Clan skyrocketing into victory. I wasn't a believer, right? We've been over this uh, at the very start for FaZe Clan, but after watching groups, I converted, um, and I, I, I want to definitely give them that credit of, like, they look like the best team in the world right now. They're just yeah. playing so well. Their gun skill is insane. Their timing is insane this aggressive play style that has dominated the meta for the last year or so and uh, right now i think they're playing it better than anybody else and yeah they look poised to to make it to the grand finals you know i i am all for the damn one kia dream cinderella run sure, right i'm yeah, all yeah. here for it if this could be apex first first ever time in the finals yeah right um whether they win or lose you know i'm here for it but um it's phase clan dude mm -hmm. i don't see them pulling an nip and choking to damn one I don't either, but I am also the the way in which I'm cool with the the Dom one going uh, like Cinderella story idea is if they win the whole thing. To me, it's not worth it if they don't like if they made grand finals. If they lose it for some reason, then that almost seems like a wasted opportunity to give Phase Clan a title that they very clearly have been fighting for for such a freaking long time. So yeah, Damwon have to have to do the entire thing. But FaZe, even just getting to this point, is like, that's showing the kind of steady growth that we were hoping for, because this was a team that got knocked out, um, either in groups or sometimes playoff first rounds for, like, a long time. They got screwed uh, at a Tokoname by not playing with their full five. They got group staged at SI. Uh, 2020, they were out earlier than anticipated, I think, for a lot of people at this year's SI. It's been steady improvement over time, and I do want them to, to get rewarded for that kind of effort. But who they end up meeting in grand finals is more the question because the other one that we had to deal with and this is where jesse and i will be very very sad just kidding we're, we're it, it's almost like it, it, it's a relative that you know is about to pass away so in your head you kind of reconcile that first and then when you go yeah. into it you're just like yep yeah, i already knew you were about to die anyway all right cool see you bye space station so nip or <laughs> nip <laughs> mother fuck, dude wow i am still sad about this i am yeah, me too. I mean, like, SSG, obviously, like, you know, we're rooting for them uh, as the NAL casters. We're going to cheer, or analysts, we're going to cheer for the NAL teams. And as the last remaining one, uh, I'm rocking the shirt. You've got yours nearby. I so, threw like, it on we my were, floor. Yeah, I mean, we were we, we were supporting the boys, but um, I did think SSG was going to come out, or uh, NIP were going to come out and win this one. This one, I think, was probably the most 50-50 in my mind after the phase BDS one. Or not face, yeah, face BDS one. Yeah. Um, I, I think that these two teams, I think if SSG had shown up and played, you know, I'm going to say the same thing I said in Mexico, but if they played like to their peak, I think they probably could have won this game. But, you know, it really felt like a repeat of Mexico. And this is something I said when I was uh, in my watch party. It's like, it's almost beat for beat how similar this, uh, this looks. They kind of struggle in groups. They got first in Mexico in their group. They did finish second in their group, so a little bit of a variation there. Mm -hmm. Then they get into playoffs against not an easy opponent, but a, a beatable opponent, I would say. And I, I think they just play play below their standards, really. Um, FaZe Clan were going, or sorry, NIP were going so aggressive uh, as we tend to expect from them, right? SSG were not dealing with it very well at all. The Rome game from NIP was so strong, and SSG just never really were able to put their foot on it and shut it down. Ah, it's uh, it's, it's very very rough. The similarities for in a, or for a space station from Mexico to Sweden, I think, are that's pretty palpable. I think the only main difference being that uh, one they played in a harder group in uh, in Sweden and also had a, a way tougher or way closer series for both maps where they did for empire because i'll make the argument that they only showed up for one half out of the four halves played uh in their mexico quarterfinal whereas here forced one map mm -hmm. to overtime other one was super close it was seven five so there's still it they're still doing better but it's still out in the quarterfinals which is uh, just as disappointing as 
their Mexico result. But the contrast here for NIP's story from both uh, Mexico to Sweden is way different. Getting over emotional, like group staged in Mexico, losing to Dom One twice and what G two once. I'm pretty sure I'm almost like G two twice. That is a crazy contrast to them going nearly undefeated in their group, which was still one that we had questions about how tough it actually was going to be. And then going and finally getting to what is now a semifinal berth, which is the furthest that they've been since SI. I would like to say if Mexico was a hurdle or a stumble, that's cool. I'm not going to say that the NIP dynasty is alive because I think that did die with their Mexico performance. But there there still isn't anything to say that they can't have a, a good uh, year overall if by winning SI um maybe a copa win at some point this year and then going and doing something far in the bracket for sweden like you can still have a good 2021 even if it meant that the word dynasty isn't one that we can really tack onto you anymore yeah i mean i think at this point like if nip were to win this major or even make it to the finals like we kind of forget about mexico right like that's fair. sure we've spent the last three months absolutely memeing on this squad <laughs> we're losing a damn Juan kia in the in the group stage twice on the same map right but at this point Dan Juan kia have shown themselves to be an extremely strong team on an international level not just at an apac level and also nip have shown that like when their mentals in the right headspace when they're feeling themselves they are also an incredibly strong team and yep. they can beat over rogue we could have the Dan Juan kia nip grand finals which would be amazing and i'm i'm so rooting for that although i think it's again going to be difficult for uh for twg right um but like you know we could we could have that rematch and we could figure out who really uh should have won in mexico and should have gone on to face liquid but you know uh i think for nip regardless they played very well this major beating ssg was again not an easy game by any stretch of the imagination um but they pulled it down and uh i think anybody's still trying to clown on them it's probably a little misguided all right, well, let's do a little bit of what is at this point ancient history review and talk about how these games went individually, and we will pull that graphic for Dom 1 and Sandbox back up. So uh, we can go map by map on this, but it doesn't have to be, like, super quick or anything. And also, yeah. by the way, chat, this may end up being just a very, like, short show overall because, you know, we'll blaze through maps. We'll talk about, like, a couple of things, but there were uh, half the maps of any standard group stage game played today, so there just will be, like, in general, some less stuff to cover. Um, but the thing that I did want to mention before we jumped into this series first was talk about bans, because now we're in a situation where best of threes are being played. There are some cases where uh, maybe a different ban phase could have worked out better for some teams, and maybe some teams ended up even losing matches in ban phases before even getting started. And then some teams have uh, subverted expectations. There's at least one team in here that definitely had what I considered to be a really tough uh, ban phase overall in terms of the maps that they did have to play, but still came out on top in spite of what the, the statistics show. So for this first series, we went Villa, Coastline, and Oregon, and it was Dom Juan going Villa first. This was their map pick. Uh, it's one that Sandbox have perma banned, yet we still went to overtime. Uh, they've had like three losses on it in spite of it being a perma ban. So like, like when they've played it in the past couple of months, they've still like given it a shot, but they haven't won it before. Um, and Dom Juan was already like super proficient on it. So for me, I did already kind of expect this to be um, a Dom Juan win, but I didn't think it would be this close. Yeah, I mean, I think for Villa, like, coming in here, being uh, the pick of Damwon Kia, you know, you, you anticipate it'll be somewhat lopsided. I can't I can't lie, Jacob, I don't have the stats in front of me for map bans, like what these teams are typically nah, good at or good. not good at. Yeah. Um, I, I will have something to say about Coastline when we get there. But broadly, yeah, I was excited for this uh, for this game from Damwon, see what they could bring out. I'm a big Villa fan, as you know. Mm -hmm. I thought that, like, at the very start, right, Damwon started on attack. And they had some really good, like, droning. They started off going three and one. They lost the first, then brought three back in a row. Um, it seemed like they were catching off these, like, off-site roamers pretty solidly. They always seemed to have that intel. Sandbox, you know, they had some strong earlier swings, um, but they lost a couple of those, like, again, they lost a couple of those roam games very early. There was one round where they're, like, they're defending on Aviator, and there's, like, two roamers trophy side, and they're dead within, like, 30 seconds. Like, damn, okay, this is, this is looking very, very strong, right? But as we got to that half swap, you know, we continue to see the back and forth um, go on and on and on. It felt like with Damwon, when they were in, like, disadvantage on defense, they'd be, they'd be trying to, like, swing and they'd be trying to come back. But, like, their positioning would just be, like, really poor a lot of the times. They wouldn't really give it a great shot. 
Sorry, Spawny wanted down. And then <laughs> uh, on the side of Sandbox, you know, they were really getting wild with a lot of these attacks. One thing that a lot of the people in my post or in my uh, my group call were saying was that like Sandbox, or sorry, yeah, Sandbox weren't super familiar with Villa, and it felt like they were looking into these attacks and just saying, "Fuck it, let's try crazy shit." You know, Ooh. they started off with the glass on uh, on yeah. Andy Taylor. <laughs> Harper was on Ash. And they just rush through study and it's like it's solid like it's a great take and it really caught uh damn one off guard there were a couple of other rounds like that like a kitchen defense where they like rushed in through the basement as well and caused a bunch of chaos and right. it didn't work that time but broadly it still felt like uh sandbox were trying a lot of kind of wacky crazy aggressive fast pushes and uh for what it was working what got them to ot if not much farther this was where uh, the point about it being a clash of styles kind of fell through the window a little bit as far as I was concerned, mostly because the way that I describe Damwon is like they, they can be very explosive, but it relies upon the performance of like two players and typically and then everyone else like helping on the back line. But for Sandbox, it can be slower and systematic to a, a degree where it's not the kind of thing you expect from APAC teams just from like a general stereotype kind of idea. But this was where we saw them buck the buck the stereotype just a bit because of that, well, fuck it, let's just move in and see what works attitude. It was a very, mm -hmm. we're throwing something at the wall and sticking to it because I think their hope was that they could win their own map pick, which was Coastline coming up. And if they didn't win Villa, it was probably no skin off their back simply because of how much they hadn't played it. It's a case where like they'd banned it uh, in almost in like the double digits and then uh, over the past three months and then where they'd played it, they'd lost it every time. So they already knew that for them, it was a weakness. Um, but then looking at just like statistically, Envy Taylor didn't even have to do that much. And Shile and Static almost won the game for them like single-handedly. And yes. there was a good chance that they that they could. Like they're, pushing it to overtime is absolutely no fluke. Yeah, and you know, I, I think they played really well to get to overtime. But Jacob, da or Sandbox Gaming had some of the worst rounds I've ever seen in rounds 13 and 14. <laughs> they played so badly. I think um, round 13, it was a kitchen attack, right? So they were, they were trying to push in onto kitchen. Um, and I, I, they stalled so long, right? They, they weren't getting in. They weren't finding kicks. They ended up pushing 5v5 super late. Um, and they actually like, get the majority of the kills. But they send Nova all alone into Pantry to push up their kitchen. And he dies with the defuse kit. And he never gets it back. I think Kat Sang kills him with the diffuser, gets one more pick, falls off, but throws a C4 there. When they finally pick up the diffuse kit, he just pops the C4, and that player dies once again. So, like, they had mana advantage. It was going to be fine. But because they put the diffuse kit where they did, it was totally over. And Lycan actually responded to one of my tweets, pointing out the fact that um, Sandbox probably expected it to be a different bomb site. They probably expected it to be uh, attacking on the top floor. And he, yeah. he noticed that they six picked into, I believe it was the Maverick, and they wanted to like get the triple wall open. But when it wasn't the top floor, uh, they ended up just getting totally caught off guard, and that's why they ended up stalling out. I thought that was a great point. And then their defense was like just as bad. They played on uh, Aviator Games, and they've got like two players in the basement, one with impacts, one with the C4. Yet the plant happens, default behind the vault door, 5v5. There's no denial from below. There's no pressure on those guys below either. The toxic babes just straight up miss. It's it, it was really frustrating to see them basically just let damn one walk in and get their plant down and just like have a great time because uh, it felt like they could have put up way more of a fight than they did in overtime, but they just rolled over and let it happen. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, speaking of rolling over, that's a perfect transition into map two because this was um, a case where the Sandbox had already gone. Uh, one of three maps one played in the group stage on coastline which to me i felt like it was a little bit of a mistake like if you've played half of your group stage games on one map then that kind of signals to your opponent one what you're going to try to go for um or maybe something that like because damwon were not going to ban coast to start with they've always banned cafe you are never going to find this team play cafe ever that has been consistent for six to nine months now so Coast was going to get through in the first place, which I still almost thought was a mistake because Dom Juan can probably read into that a little bit and understand how they're supposed to counter it. And they did. And it was literally, hey, Rin, go get kills. And he did. How many kills did he end up having in this one? Do we have stats off the rip? Because good God, this was Rin unhinged. It's a <laughs> fraggers map. This is exactly what he's designed to do. 16 and 5. It wasn't the strongest performance on the day, but he is also the primary reason why guys like Envy Taylor and Static who were good in the last map were incapable of doing anything 
uh, against Dom One Key on map two. Yeah, this is the map where my notes are just R I N in all caps. Like he actually <laughs> could not miss in this entire game. The intel he was being fed once they were on attack or while well, they were on attack as well from the drones were so strong. Like he always knew where players were. He was always taking heads up gunfights and he always had that intel advantage when he was going in. Really, really some strong stuff coming out from Rin. Um, as you mentioned, like Coastline is a map that these two teams played a lot in the group stage. Sandbox Gaming particularly, I believe, played it three times. And of yep. those three group stage games, I watched two of them. Both were against Team 1. And in both of them, they both got them their losses. shit kicked in. Like, it wasn't yeah. close. 7-2, 7-1. And then they come out and pick it in a best of three. Where, again, you've got effectively five maps to choose from because your opponent only gets one auto ban. Really? So your your record on coastline for this event, to be clear, is 7-1, 7-2. They did get a 7-4 win over Dark Zero, and then 7-1 again in playoffs. Like, this feels like such a huge mistake. I do think it was momentum-based. You know, by the end, their mental looks totally chalked. I believe to yeah. end it, they had a team kill, which, like, they were in a 2v2, which was, like, winnable, like, pretty even. And then they just, like, team kill, and it's over, and it's like, oh, man. That, mm. that could have gone so better. Um, there was some bad like smoke play as well. I thought both Nova and Harper were making some some mistakes uh, on the operator in, in the first half. So, yeah, uh, question the map pick. We'll question it for a long time, I think. Obviously, they feel they're strong on it, and I would be willing to bet if you look at their APAC North results, they probably are strong on it usually. But this major, it just was not their place to play, and uh, Damo and Kia took it seven in a row, a 7-1 victory. I'm going to say, it's cute how they managed to get just the one round like to start off with, and then it was a complete avalanche from that point on. Yep. Uh, yeah, I will make the argument that a better map for Sandbox to pick in this case probably would have been Oregon. It was played by Dom1, I believe, one time in groups, and it was against Empire, and they won it, which shouldn't have been enough reason, in my opinion, to scare Sandbox out of picking it. One, because they are good on that map, historically. Um, Korean teams seem to like it, but especially Sandbox. So they probably should have gone to it anyway. And the only reason that Dom1 won it was because Empire were playing really stupid. They did something that they do, which is uh, evidently more historic than just in that one game, which is putting always on uh, Shepard's roles and having him be primary hard breach and diffuser plant and then flexing that sledge roll over to Scyther, which is something that they've done in EUL before, but not something that has any like actual ground to stand on. And it, it, it hasn't worked out. So that the only reason why I think Dom Juan really beat the crap out of Empire there was because Empire played dumb. Sandbox probably should have gone to Oregon. It's a map that they like like more consistently, um, and they paid for it. Like everyone's stats overall from the Villa game were pretty good, and then when you factor all of them in for Coastline, and you see how much red it fills up the the bottom of the stat sheet here overall. This is the combined stats for both series. And me Taylor somebody who we needed to show up who we touted in the CGGG thing as needing to have a really good uh like group stage and he did to be fair but then fell off in playoffs because of that map um and fucking rin 27 kills we're gonna keep tabs on how uh, who had the the kill most kills throughout the day i think rin is up there but i think cyber had like 30 so we'll have to do a double check later yeah i mean when there's a 7-1 it's tough right it's tough to break those records um but uh yeah rin uh Rin did really, like, dominate on Coastline, and uh, when he was swinging, there was not much to it. I, I did, like, talk trash on, like, how Sandbox played uh, Coastline in groups. I was about damn well played really poorly on Sandbo uh, on Coastline in groups. The one game I watched from them was uh, was a Team Empire match, where, like, Empire just played it super aggressively, and, like, damn one were not shooting back at all. Very happy we did not see that version of damn one Kia um, come out in full force, and and just throw the game to sandbox um because this was yeah this was a real looking team at least on half the, half the side i mean i am happy that the prediction for most people was that damon were going to go because i'm firmly in their camp uh if there's a way that i can get yeah. some, some some dwg merch uh at this point it, like okay, just if it, chill I, I i no well no no i'm saying i'd love to purchase it i just don't know if it's only available in korea like in the same way that like the nip oh. uh, r6 gear is only available in brazil like it's literally region locked so i like if I, if I can get like some pants or something unless there's a, an american representative for uh for dumb one kia who ends up watching the stuff that we make and if so there's the shill just, got it please please send it to both of us not just me uh got, got to spread the love around and to tango our producer who's been killing it on the back end as of late love this guy listen if you show us your products we'll wear it on post shows ssg we will this and also probably for future post shows uh if we could get sponsors 
that'd be that'd be sick that mean then we can maybe even pay the people that are working on this i'm just kidding no pay for anybody all right second semi-final rogue team one uh i called this probably the only like like the only guarantee overall which is hilarious because wow. at one point I, I i did guarantee rogue to beat virtus pro probably from one of the online majors like like the november major or something and they didn't uh and team one had every expectation to win this game mostly because it was a number one seed against the number two seed team one did have a pretty good group overall um and they're the reigning champs so they're you're never going to bet against the team that won last time overall especially given the stat that you mentioned uh, from what the post showed from two days ago about the team that wins one major and always goes deep in, in the next uh -huh. one. But always gets second. Yeah, always second. Not here. This is, uh, I mean, because there was one other tournament where I think it, the, they, the winner didn't end up getting second. Oh, it was consistent. Which one it every, single, every single major. It was it? Do SI, but yes. Oh, was... no. With, with Sorry. With, uh, SI was what I was factoring into mm, that. So, okay. yeah. yeah. It's just for majors. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, team one sucks. What's new? Ah. <sighs> this this is new <laughs> so jacob they started on cafe and they, mm -hmm. they started so good right they go they got a five one half jacob they're playing on defense they're doing great levy starts the game with some just like ridiculous clutches he and lagonis like clutched round one which they never should have been able to and then he got a 4k on round two to clutch mm -hmm. it up um and and like you know rogue were like playing pretty well actually at the very start of this game but like it didn't matter because one were always there late it seemed like whether Rogue were winning the early game or losing the early game, it didn't really matter. Because when they had to execute, you know, they would stall out and they would throw. It's always this pattern of Rogue just like dropping the ball when you got to that late round. But then we swap sides, you know, and, and Aces starts by spawn peeking out and, and getting a pick, right? And it's like, okay, well, that's you know, that's not going to happen every round. And then more Valcams go outside the building in the next round. You're like, okay, well, they, they got to start finding these at some point. And then Aces gets like a 2k and a 2v2, and there's more intel all over the map in both the forms of like Valkyrie and Echo Drones. And you're just like, okay, one, please find something. <laughs> and they call attack timeout, right? They call attack timeout, the coach talks to them, Chubbs has a conversation, and then Alan Mouse switches to Nook, and you're like, okay, not what I would have gone with, but right. at least it's, you know, it's an idea. And it's a reading take. They actually win that round, round number 10. Uh, they focus the plant, they recognize where everybody was, and, and they have a good execute. And you're like, this is what we expect. Match point for Team 1. They got two more chances to lock it out, and then they lost three in a row and lost in overtime eventually. And it's just like, goddamn. Aces was the MVP <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because he was in chat earlier. He, oh, he dragged out was, of his yeah. mind. Played a fantastic game. Um, these jump outs were just... They were so good, and... Team One never brought an IQ, never once, and they. I legitimately think there's a Valk camo to the building every single round. If not, it was close, four rounds at a minimum. Because Jesus, that was uh, that was the path to victory for Rogue, and Team One just never dealt with it. They couldn't help themselves on runouts either, because this was a thing they did in their win over Face Clan. Was Cryon usually had a window prepped, roaming on Jaeger someplace to do something against people who were uh, on window repel, mm -hmm. and it was something he 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 punished. Uh, he punished Team One with in this match. At the same time that Aces is creating havoc with the exterior Valcams, which is something that again, Team One was not countering. Like you can, uh, what they ended up having to do in lieu of an IQ pick was there was a moment where I remember Aces still had probably like one or two cans in his pocket and he's sitting up in piano and he's throwing them outside. And what he does is Lagonis is having to wait at the window, doing nothing but watching it, waiting for him to throw it late because he probably throws it at like maybe like 2.30 or something over the course of this particular round. He has to wait for so long, he can't help affect entry into a building. Team One is an incredible attacking team when they're able to get into whatever map they're in, but if they have to wait on the outside for super long, that's kind of what ended up being their kryptonite. It didn't rear its ugly head nearly as much on Oregon, but it's still kind of the same idea, and it got so bad that on map two, Team One just banned Valk outright. They're like, screw this, we're not letting this get the better of us anymore. Aces can't use pre-nerf Valk to the, to the same extent as much as he did and it's just like it, I, I was a master class of what you're supposed to do and if you want to do that if you want to do what Aces did in this game you have like three weeks until high caliber ends up launching so you have so little time to chuck your Valcams out and go for easy spawn peaks because that was the story of this game overall Prano was holding it down on the back end Leon was doing great too but it, it's it, for me it's Aces and crime.
Asus saw the patch notes. It was like, oh, fuck, I got to abuse this mechanic while it's still in the game. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I do like that you mentioned Cryon. I know he's at the bottom of the stat board there, but I also agree that Cryon had uh, a huge impact on defense. I think when yeah. they were in that first half, like he was definitely one of the guys that was struggling. I don't think he was really finding the kill, board, uh, the kill feed, but like round seven and eight, especially on those white stairs, had some really uh, high impact kills. And I think that continued throughout their defensive half. So thought he was good prano is another one that we i think we mentioned earlier on that i was really impressed with um you know as kind of that, like support player it seemed like he was like solid and particularly in groups was like he was a player that i noticed like really pulling his weight and and playing his role well so you know we'll probably aces will get like all the highlights and, and everybody will talk about him um yeah but i think rogue as a team played this game very well Especially on map two, where I felt like this was more meant to be kind of like a playground, uh, so to speak, for team one. Maybe not exactly, because it was one that they didn't play uh, a whole bunch. Yeah, so mm -hmm. on for, for Cafe, Rogue had played it uh, three times in the group stage. They were one and two on it. The one time that they won uh, was when they played FaZe Clan, and then they lost it that one. Oh, sorry, no, that they were two and one. The one time they ended up losing it overall was that OXG game that we shouldn't, uh, well, they probably want to forget exists. It was the one time OXG won a game for the whole major. Um, and it was a team one permaban. So the fact that it was even still a close game is a cool thing that, that went to OT. But for the Oregon one specifically, this was a rogue permaban, and this was still one of team one's stronger maps overall. So this is like, th this favors them really heavily. Again, it's a best of three. Rogue opted to ban Coastline, didn't want to deal with it so something that they didn't like was going to slip through the pool and this was where they played tighter on refrags probably more than any team that i've seen so far in this tournament this was someone is always behind the guy entering always there are two people who are following a drone into a building not just one they are in tandem and probably in some kind of vulcan mind meld at the same time because their communication was on point they weren't stumbling over one another which i think is kind of a hallmark of some teams in the past where like if they're out of position it's very much because they don't know where everyone else is meant to be they had everything locked down they weren't uh having two people watch the same angle at the same time like to a point where there was risk of crossfires at, at bad moments they were locked and dialed in and i love the way that they played on a map that won like we we've given them so much credit for over the past six months since si about how well they've played this map they did it again here but only because rogue let a couple of things slip through the cracks and still played everything else to a t yeah i mean it you, you said that rogue hadn't really played this map at all recently right yeah it's something that they've they've traditionally permabanned and if they okay. usually play it they lose it yeah, I mean, that, that's, like, good to know because it felt like for the first two rounds, Rogue were really trying, like, some creative strategies. Uh, they played Laundry with a bunch of drones on out where they, like, really held down meeting and they, like, tried to lock that down as, like, a site extension. And then they mm -hmm. played Dorms with, like, a really heavy, like, off-site uh, presence on the bottom floor, right? I think at some, I think four of their five players at some point were playing on the bottom floor on, those, uh, on that Dorms defense. Um, and frankly, like, these two holds they brought out, were just terrible. I mean, they Team One shredded them uh, each and every time. They hit the site really fast on that laundry defense. Um, again, they kind of just walked in on the dorms defense after dealing with some of those bottom floor roamers uh, from Rogue. So it didn't look like it was going very well, but I did like the adaptation. They started playing more uh, hunker down in strong positions. There was their um, there was their dining hold, which I really liked, where they had yeah, Leon yeah. and Cryon in small tower. And they get three kills all without being clear. Like they went off in offsite position. So like those were the plays that I really liked. And after going down 2-0 early, they bounce back on every single one of their defenses, which on Oregon is a big deal because if you lose your Oregon defenses, that usually spells the end for your team. And uh, in the second half, team one learned that the hard way. They got three attacking rounds and uh, it just felt like you know, Team 1 were kind of losing in the micro to some really good nades, some fast pushes. The mechanics there from Rogue were very strong. I think the mental game was certainly um, a factor for Rogue. Felt like they were very confident in a lot of these takes. And Team 1 were kind of shaking. KDS, I don't know if we're pulling up stats anytime soon here, but he took eight rounds to find a kill. He was double... O no, I think he took seven rounds. Like He, got, he went 0-6 through the first half. And then they finally mm -hmm. uh, won on round seven, and he got a couple of kills there. So not getting, not having any impact effectively through your entire attacking half is a big problem. KDS, he's had you know great games in the past, but this just was not one of them. And I got to imagine that's partly mental. Losing that last map seven eight is really really tragic, um, and maybe just part of it not really meshing with sort of the weird holds and, and creative stuff that Roker bring out on defense.
Yeah, the fact that both maps were really close is going to be a case where one were, were kicking themselves because map three was Chalet, which is a map that Rogue have banned more than they've played, I think, despite having a, a positive record on it. And it was a, it's a really good map for Team One. They love it in Brazil. They love taking teams to this internationally. It was something that they couldn't do. And it was an, it, like it, all they had to do theoretically was win one round on cafe and, and then if oregon went the same then they probably had a better chance to win this series outright but it didn't happen and i did want to touch on that kds point as well because on map one he played a lot of finca on attack and didn't have any kills again through his first half and it was the same situation over and over again where somebody who traditionally can fit into a second entry position where we expect him to be a second entry flex probably what he's doing is so absent or off the map that it, it feels like he's either trying to do something only with the purpose of getting one kill and then from there it results in nothing and it's it's really disappointing for somebody like him who i think we touted uh in mexico as being super pivotal and then guys mm -hmm. like levy and alamau step the fuck up at the plate so if he shows up maybe this this entire series goes differently but for the most part if we have overall stats you can kind of tell um he probably he, i think he was still in like double digit kills overall he wasn't like super levels of not being able to find the scoreboard but at the same right. time it still didn't it, 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 he needed to be there and he wasn't yeah i mean over 27 rounds just breaking double digits barely um he got 12 overall is nothing to be super excited about obviously um the lowest that anybody got on rogue i guess rips got 13 but he went third rips went yeah. 13 and 14 kds went 12 and 22 so that's kind of the difference uh when you're looking at it that way and you're right you know playing that sort of second entry flex role i think it's exactly how he plays um he has to be that guy that supports alamo right on their entry and getting in aggressively neskin as well i think you can point fingers at for being a, a aggressive player he's supposed to be their top down their buck their sledge he's supposed to be sort of in that role yet wasn't able to find the kill feed very often at all so alibi was all right he went 18 and 20 again you know maybe not his best performance ever but i think compared to some of the other fragging roles of this team that was an area where you know they were struggling look at that levy and neskin like this is the support duo right mm -hmm. yeah levy was still doing his not his... neskin but still well well right but his uh his flank watch uh capability was something that he, he keeps on proving like uh every tournament that he's in and i believe he was he was top rated in the series overall for team one so still the the six mexico major mvp title still holding strong and keeps on validating uh our overall pick for event mvp which i think was really cool there we go yep 27. Yeah. so he ended up having as many kills as rin did uh over more rounds obviously but aces dropped 28 and prano again I will make the case for Prano being one of the best pickups probably for any team in tier one competition this year as being somebody who is IGLing because that was something that Rogue very clearly needed to make a switch up in. I believe it was Aces mostly before, but they wanted somebody with a different mind to kind of figure out how they wanted to structure themselves. He's a support player. He's usually playing smoke. He's always on hard breach. You're always going to find him with diffuser. He's got the biggest plant stat of anyone in the EUL. And then he's also capable of fragging and I'll make the case if he like granted his stat line being 20 kills and there's still like multiple people below him that have 19 that's still cool but if he doesn't frag out like this if he's not the the swiss army knife that he's so far proven himself to be rogue don't get to this point he is such a pivotal ingredient for this team that was missing back when Karzeka was on this roster and they look they, they, they look so 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 much better and i'm really happy that they found a missing puzzle piece like this Dude, they just must make support players differently in Europe. They're just better than everybody else. Like, <laughs> yeah. In Mexico, our conversation was like, okay, well, who's the best support player in the world? Is it Breed or is it Shepard? Right? And like yep. those those two were kind of the names. But now Prano's coming in from Rogue and also playing really, really well. I think it's got to be in that conversation. Um, it just seems like all of these European support players come out and they have such an impact on the game. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Credit to uh, kind of makes me hope guys. that. Uh... It makes me hope that Goga can have a really good stint with Movistar Riders and get get them into CL at some point, like next year. I don't know there you go. what that would take, but uh, Goga, come back, please. We'll get there. All right. The third semi, or third semi, wow, that's not even possible given the nature of the word semi. Good job. Phase BDS in the quarterfinal. Uh, man... So I called this one. Did you like uh what was your prediction on this game again? I remember demo yeah, I refused phase. to vote on this. You picked phase? Okay, cool. I picked phase. Uh 
this seemed more like a case of FaZe just being the more innovative team overall and BDS kind of playing the exact same way that they've played. Like some of their takes seemed super telegraphed. They weren't very different. Uh, and FaZe Clan took the series. Uh, FaZe takes it. It's not about to be a saying, but I may have to trade market in case they win the major outright. Uh, went to bank. So both maps here were interesting in terms of like, like the ones that were played, not the decider. Um, both maps in bank and chalet were maps that FaZe had a 100% win rate on over three months, but typically banned. Not necessarily a perma ban, but ones that when they play, they always win, but they just opt to never play it. Um, for Bank, it was probably their, oh, arguably one of their better maps in that team uh, time frame, and Chalet was also super strong for them too. So this was kind of a case where I didn't really know who won in the ban phase. Probably I would have swung it towards BDS just a tad bit, understanding that they are more willing to play both Bank and Chalet more so than FaZe Clan is, especially as of late. So it was it was a little difficult to kind of give one team an advantage over the other. But when we went to Bank, FaZe just FaZe tore the house down, dude, and BDS didn't have a response for most of this map. Yeah, it felt like Bank was one where, like, we started off... We started off with, like, a big, a big flashy play from Alems, right? They're defending on the basement... Um, Alems is playing smoke on server stairs, and you've seen this a million times if you watched old Pro League when Bank was still in the pool. Smoke with a shield and ADSs and server stairs just goes nuts. You get, I think he got one kill from like a player above him, and then two players dropped into server. They had cleared the guy in server with a nade, and then um, he, he turned around and killed both of them as well. So he pops off, right? He plays super, super well. But then they like they run that, you know, then things go back and forth a little bit. EDS end up uh, tied 2-2. Two, two. They run the bomb site back, right? And at this point, they move the shield from the top of these server stairs down to, like, the actual server area where Jaeger's trying to play behind the server. And this time, he gets zero kills. He just isn't able to have that same impact that he had when he had that safety of the shield. Similarly, mm -hmm. the Jaeger, like, because of the position of the shield, the ADSs couldn't actually, like, protect the shield. So they just shot, like, a, they just shot, like, a gone six with the shield from the hatch inside a server, and it was gone. And as soon as it left, like, the Jaeger just bolted out of there. So he was gone from service in, like, 15 seconds. And then on his retreat back to site, he got caught from the hatch inside of, uh, in, inside of security or CCTV. So, like, it, it was a total disaster of a play, disaster of an adaptation. I don't know why they changed it when it was working so well, at least in that first round. And broadly, like, it just seemed like they weren't playing the best setups that I've ever seen on side of bank. They got mm -hmm. kind of screwed over on one of their top floor holds by not bringing any plant denial. Um, and although there was, like, there was fighting back for sure in that first half, it did feel like FaZe were just destroying them in the micro, winning each of these fights, pushing together, having a great first half. Um, and that kind of continued onto the defense, right? The one round um, that caused BDS to call attack timeout was round number nine. I think it's a 2v4 cyber and cameraman and they look there's like two people on the ceo windows right plant's not down one, yet yeah. but the, you know there's a couple of seconds till plant goes down and they just take some ridiculous gunfights um cameraman's positioning is so good to push up with the smoke and uh even in these rounds where like phase clans in such a dire position they pull it back with just this crazy gun skill and uh bds didn't seem to have an answer for it. Shiko, I don't think I wrote down his name even once. I don't know what his stats were. He didn't right have now. anything super great. Yeah, it five was... seven. Ew. Woo. That's you need yeah. more from that. Renshiro led the way, but Renshiro is also probably one of the most stalwart uh, sludge players to grace Europe, probably most of the world. Honestly, I don't know if he like ranks super high on sludge, but he's still very very solid. And the problem for me was more BDS's attacks because when they made the half transition, it felt like. The, what they were doing just wasn't that different from how they'd played Bank before. They did some takes that were exactly the same as what they did against Invictus in a game that didn't matter for Jack anything that was 7-1 BDS win. Like when they were upstairs trying to plant uh, in CEO, they did what was a very standard double uh, window repel coverage, smoke in, have one person either come from Trump or back from stock side and just try to get like one or two angles in and it was basic smoke plant like you mentioned there wasn't nearly as much defender utility or uh like um wall denial as there probably should have been or plant denial specifically from phase plan in that round but it was something that they still easily countered they had angles open up they had cyber i think or somebody with an smg 11 like had a had a hole open uh in the janitor wall through the or th through both janitor walls and just pops whoever the whoever the planter is with a really nice angle there wasn't a lot of innovation from BDS in this game, which was the thing that for me kind of stunk the most because it felt like 
the phase didn't allow their mental to spiral out of control or anything, which is something that you can kind of exploit with Brazilian teams, just understanding how emotional they can be typically. And IP is probably the best example of that. But BDS just didn't have any reasons to get excited in this game, and it, it fell fat or it fell flat really fast. Yeah, I definitely agree with you that like on defense, like if they got two rounds on defense, one round on attack, but it felt like even the rounds they were losing on defense, like there was still a good amount of just like them fighting back and they had a chance on all those rounds. Their attacks yeah. definitely looked a lot weaker. Um, it felt like uh, they were really stalling for a lot of those rounds. And I feel like that's something that people fall back on too often, but like they really were just doing it to themselves. Like there was one round, the final round, CCTV cash or not CCTV cash, that's clubhouse seems to be lockers <laughs> i do that so often Insane. um they, they you know it's a 4v4 and then they're trying to take from like the back they're trying to drop into gold and everything but they just spend so long staring at the gold hatch you know maybe they're throwing utility in but they're not accomplishing anything with that utility right like they're throwing a smoker and, and such every now and again they do have to wait up talk to babes but it takes them a long point to even get to that point um and then the smoke just gets behind them like the smoke pushes up kind of behind the hatch uh, gets like two big picks and then like they they're in man disadvantage like after all of that prep they couldn't even find the smoke and, and stop him from aggressing so so far up against the hatch so it just did feel like there was a lot of stuff going wrong in those attacks and uh when they lost their own map pick i was uh, i was a little worried jacob but at least it yep. was closer on chalet a little bit, yeah. Transition is good, but this was still, like, it came down to OT match point, and I will harp on that just for a little bit because, man, Rafal almost 1v5 clutched the damn thing yep. and sent us to a map three. If you go back and you watch how round 15 went on Chalet, you'll realize how close he was not only to stalling out a plant, and killing three people on his way to trying to kill the planter, but how close his crosshair was to find the final kill and making BDS uh, or stalling them out and getting them to go to Oregon and giving us a map three, giving BDS a shot. But yeah, this one, this one was disappointing. Cyber was on a goddamn heater though, and that that was the case for both maps, by the way. There wasn't a single kill he wasn't landing. There wasn't an angle that he wasn't holding. Um, it seemed like BDS just really kind of gave into what Vase Clan were doing a little bit too easily. And this map overall was a lot of fun to watch. This has a probably some of the most rewatchability of any of the maps that was played overall today. But yeah, same story, end of day. Uh, Frostban was the only weird thing that I saw initially because NA typically loves to run Frost even like regardless of the fact that the, the scope got nerfed from her a little while ago. Um, it just meant that there was more opportunities for BDS to make some of those uh, important rush or faster paced plays if they wanted to. But there was also a Jaeger ban in this game. So what did we see? A lot more operators picking considerable amounts of frag like utility or um, what we had like eight frag grenades sometimes on the map at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that Jaeger ban, I was going to talk on it, so I'm glad you touched on it as well. That's something that, like, BDS brought out, and I really do think it was a big reason why they were able to push this all the way to 15 rounds. But, like, when BDS were on their defenses, it wasn't something that FaZe Clan was able to really take advantage of. BDS were still playing, like, some really strong, kind of, like, off-site positions that FaZe Clan were never able to root them out of. Um, just because it didn't seem like they were bringing, like, as many frag grenades that we saw inside of BDS. It didn't feel like they were doing as good of a job of that. Um, and, and BDS kind of just were able to play these, like, somewhat default, um, defenses, but with the addition of not, you know, not, uh, not getting naded when it should have been fairly easy to root them out with some of these frag grenades, but didn't feel like that was coming out. On the other hand, BDS moved on to attack, and, uh, they were getting a lot of these opening picks. You know, they were, um, they were having a great time for the first four rounds, and then round 10 happens, and phase plan call attack timeout. And whatever their coach says to them in that moment, um, beyond that, they only lose a single round. They go four for four, four out of five, right for the remainder of uh, of the match. And uh, they stop giving up that opening pick. They're forcing BDS to stall out when they're pushing these bomb sites and when they're pushing these offsite positions. And uh, yeah, they they ended up playing way way better. And uh, I guess they're round fifteen. And as you mentioned, Rafael almost clutches it. He brings it to a one v one, but Cyber says no. Yep, and I think we actually have that round that we can bring up real quick just oh, to, to, to give you a scope about how close this damn thing was because, man, I wanted them to win it so bad. So, oh, wow. So, well, we have a whole bunch of good. leeway that we're starting with here. So, it kind of gives you the full picture. It was it was so damn close. Olems, I kind of feel like, wasn't playing 
as well as it could have been like i think he, he was either entry pick in this round specifically or on vigil was what wasn't able to get a kill he was wasting a little bit of time but it wasn't super substantial and i i feel like if he was alive a little bit longer in this round it would have been easier for them to maybe get a win that wasn't a clutch yep there i have a perfect memory it seems so he's dead first and cyber is about to be the one to tear through this entire uh defensive game plan from bds but remember the focus is on rafal yeah they're holding on to kitchen right and bds with this one loss uh, of player is like you know you're kind of rough here i do like like the setup broadly, bringing that intel on the Valkyrie, bringing a lot of aggressive roam plays. I don't think this is a bomb site that you can just chill like on site. You have to hold above, so they're doing that. The phase clan cleared it very, very quickly. And look at them, they're already into sight. They're rushing in. Cyber's getting a kill. He's getting like three kills now. Perfect coverage, dude. It's gonna be four. There's the C4. It's not quite a 1v5, it's a 1v4. No, it's a 1v3, there we go. But Rafael pushes it to that. He's already gotten a couple of kills this round. And I'm just like, oh, oh, oh. And he literally gets his kill. He looks the wrong way. Pain, man. I wanted him to do it. I wanted, like, I, I thought there was a chance because when Yana swings him, I'm like, Yana mm. didn't have to swing because now that leaves Planter essentially totally unguarded. And when he kills Planter, at that point, I don't know where last guy is. I figure when he makes the swing back towards Fireplace that that's where the, the final coverage is situated. I, did, I didn't know that Cyber was still posted up inside Kitchen. I thought maybe he made a rotate back out once he got his two covering kills. But instead, he's there. All like If, if Rafal doesn't swing over to the right, like he just has zero intel on where uh, Cyber's based, which is unfortunate because there were like he, he got two kills covering the post plant or covering the plant prior to that uh final 1v1 ensuing that only lasted about two seconds so really good game overall in spite of it being a bds loss i think uh this was a game where Bride didn't really show up stats wise but almost like didn't need to like we've touted him as being one of the better support players one of the flashier support players he didn't need to be um it would be cool if he did better but uh only had five kills per game uh for both of the maps in this series. And I feel like I feel like Shiko also didn't have nearly as explosive of a day either, because he was really, really good in groups. Yeah, I mean, Shiko, I think what we've talked about for this entire tournament, I mean, you say he's good in groups. I say he had some bad performances in groups that kind of looked some like bad this. plays in groups, yeah. I I'm a stick to performances. I don't know the exact stats, okay, okay. but I think they're like from the games I watched, Shiko was not putting up his like E well dominant performance. And I believe it was SI where he also went, like, relatively quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, that kind of makes, like, two out of three lands of this, of you know, the calendar year 2021 where Shiko's just not really been this explosive big player. And maybe that's, like, because he's, like, shaking, uh, you know, having problems on land. Maybe it's just the play style of new BDS that we're, like, not getting used to uh, in, in time and BDS are actually fine. But um, I don't know. It's... It, it's really making it hard to call Shiko the best player in the world, as all the European casters seem to want to do. I He's definitely not the best player of this tournament, even as somebody who loves uh, what shiko has been able to do on BDS. I wouldn't even call him the best player in the world. Honestly, like that seems like a distinction, say, for like, a considerable... like Some Brazilian, above him. at least. Some, probably, yeah. And maybe Hot and Cold, maybe. But Hot and Cold also hasn't been doing like as good internationally. It's almost like he gets them through like NAL stages, and then... Yeah. Uh, like rampier faults usually cleans up actually fucking hell that leads us beautifully into our last series of the day look at that i'm a segue god okay killing it nip and ssg uh i did pull up map uh information about this one too this was let's just clarify in spite of a really disappointing mexico exit for ssg this happened in the exact same score line with them getting the same overall no, sorry no in a placement in groups was different because what they were first in group b in yes. mexico and then they were second in sweden Correct. so still looked like um th there were some similarities overall but this series was closer it wasn't like the empire stomp that we had in mexico's uh, quarterfinals this was a seven five and then it would be an eight six on coastline later Th both of these maps were ones that i figured ssg had lost in the ban phase this was like a legitimate case of both of them being ones that favored an ip more because both of them both of these have been at like ssg perma bans like name the maps they play in the nal chalet or coastline simply isn't on their docket villa maybe a tad bit more but it's it's like an ip had perma ban chalet but had two wins on it prior in the past three months and coast 
they were willing to play on it, but they weren't as consistent. But still, these were maps that SSG, I, I think it's fair to say they were saving some things for it. Like they didn't want to reveal all their cards and that they didn't have to play it in the NAL, they, they wouldn't have to. Because both maps were still really close, but I looked at it and went, they got to bring out something really, really crazy. Like literally pull all the stops out. Because like if you make grand finals, doesn't matter. Pull it out here. And then maybe you'll have a chance of surviving an IP, but they couldn't do that here. Yeah, I mean... I think on defense, SG looked very good here, which is like what we've come to expect from them, right? I think they looked like a solid, like strong team. But on offense, SSG looked very uncomfortable with the way that NIP were playing. They ended up winning three attacking rounds out of 13. So they were really, really struggling. And again, it's Chalet Coastline. Like this isn't Oregon. They're really right. struggling with like how out there and ip are playing and sort of that's where i think the struggles have come from them and that's where i think you can look at ssg's gameplay and be like wow it really didn't play these attacks very well at all um because yeah i mean we started on chalet right and ssg i think have good holds you know they they'll get like one important pick and then they'll know when to fall off right they can kind of play that aggressive style that chalet does demand and it's going relatively well nip were struggling to keep drones alive ssg denying that information has always been something they've been very good at um, and it felt like NIP could only really get attacking rounds based off of these like explosive pushes, whether they were going for a rush one round or they were sort of stalling out until they get a bunch of like early picks and all jump it together. And like they don't really win in the early round at all. It seemed like that was always going the way of SSG. But then you swap sides and uh, the script seems to flip as well, Jacob, because nip were getting in you know very aggressive on their holds uh they're holding above or they're holding just off site positions and they're not leaving that's the big thing for me right like they'll be holding trophy right and typically not trophy they'll be holding kitchen right which typically mm -hmm. on this bomb site you'll you'll hold kitchen you'll always have somebody above right that's normal that's not anything uh over aggressive so they'll hold a couple players up above and then maybe at like a minute or like 45 seconds if you've had a successful roam game you'll fall off right Maybe you've got man advantage, maybe it's even, but at this point, there's not enough time for the attackers to really utilize that top floor, and you'll be okay. NIP were on the top floor until the end of the round. They would not give it up. <laughs> I think it was the final, no, the second last round, round 11, they ran this they, they ran this strat where they bring two Kona stations, a mute jammer, and like two reinforcements or something, and that's all the utility they have on the top floor. That's all right. that they need. They play really aggressive operators like a Legion and an Oryx. And again, this Thunderbird, which really is able to like sustain them whilst they're up on that top floor. And SSG are just like throwing bodies at them. They're trying to peek, they're trying to get some picks, but they're never successful to be able to break through that top floor hold. And uh, it, it really impressed me how long NIP were able to hold on to these offside positions. In none of their defenses did they ever bring like a crazy amount of utility. They were bringing a lot of Oryx, they were bringing a lot of Legion, they were bringing a good enough, uh, amount of Thunderbird as well. And it really felt like they were going to take operators that could run around, play flexible, have good roams, take good gunfights. And uh, they weren't super concerned about like SSG throwing in nades and clearing out like whatever they had. Um, right. They just, they played their gunplay and uh, it worked so well. And SSG never seemed to be able to get through those offsite positions and, and go for a good hold or go for a good clear. There was something that started in this game that was a worrying trend all the way through to Coast, which made the entire thing a fucking nail-biter, which was if SSG were getting rounds won, it was usually because an execute was happening within like the last couple of seconds or because there, it was very, very even man count for a majority of, of, of a round. When they lost rounds, it was because they were usually getting killed early there wasn't a trade and then it would it would avalanche and, and just fall down from there which was almost like it made me concerned that every time nip just got an opening kill it was almost like there wasn't a way for ssg to recover from that point because of how potent the roam was because of how how like telegraphed in some cases ssg's positions were and how easy it was for them to kind of get picked out of a crowd um and the entry rating honestly doesn't even feel like it should be this good for this map i think for coastline it'll definitely be a lot worse because that was where this this gut feeling of oh you lost a player you're gonna yeah. lose the round it, it was definitely more prevalent on coastline but for this one it felt like this was just the start of a downward trend especially when ssg were up 5-2 and then it's just skid 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 they win one more round on uh on side swap and that was it yeah it uh 
It was definitely an aggressive game, and it was one where, especially, again, on those uh, defenses, NIP were definitely getting a lot of those opening picks and, and playing well in terms of, like, extending these Rome games into victories. Whereas it felt like, you know, when SSG were defending, they were winning, or when NIP were attacking, they were winning these rounds, like, in the in the very late game when they would get there. Um, but when yeah. NIP were, def- were defending, it was always the early round, right? SSG never got a foothold. And I'll agree that a lot of, a lot of Chalet translated to coastline right nip yep. ended on defense and then they started on defense for map two so they were on defense back to back between the two maps and they played it almost beat for beat the exact same right very little utility you're running this oryx you're running around with these aggressive operators right you're trying to just like shake ssg and make them feel like they're they're playing scared and they're not playing well and, and it got the same result another like four two split where uh where nip are winning on this uh on this defensive half uh, i thought pino went really hard to end off the half i think he got an entry 2k in round five and then a 3k in the 3v3 in round six so he had some huge moments uh in that half and i think was probably my mvp for them in this matchup it was hard That's to find fair, one yeah. i think they all played very <laughs> very well um for ssg it felt like when they were attacking on coastline they would always lose a couple players, right? Because it's aggressive roam game. And it didn't necessarily mean yep. they were losing, like, the man advantage. Like, the trading was pretty solid from SSG on their attacks, right? But that would mean it'd be, like, a 3v3 or something heading into the late round. And on Coastline, that's just not enough players to hold very much map control. So then there would be, like, a flank that would come in later. Or there would be, like, some pressure coming from an area that they don't expect or they can't watch. So they can't have that man advantage. And NIP could really play a lot more freely because they knew that SSG was going to stall for a bit. They weren't going to immediately run to that bomb site. They can send somebody to go for a flank, even if they don't have that many players alive, and it was going right. to work out for them. And uh, yeah, SSG pulled it back, right? When they got to that second half, they played on uh, on defense. They racked up five or four rounds of their own, but uh, then they go back to, uh, to, to overtime. And um, once again, NIP are just way too strong. I, there's one thing I did. I would be remiss if I didn't mention on... Cafe, we did see. God, what was the cafe? What was the freaking ban? No, on cafe we saw a Ying ban, which made it really difficult. Chalet, SSG had. I'm oh, sorry, Chalet. You're right. There you go. It was a Ying ban, and that's something that we know SSG loves to play. They love to execute off of a Ying. They love the free use of the Candelas. That's how they beat Empire on both times that they played on Villa. That was scouted well by NIP. They removed the ability to play it. In this case, we had a Lion ban, which on Coastline makes a little bit more sense. And obviously, SSG just don't play Coastline frequently enough, so we don't really know what like their ban tendency would be there. But I, I do still think it was a case where that was something Bosco couldn't play. And Bosco ended up being somebody who tried like, something else for crowd control or flank watch. He was still trying to play into his role. But without one pivotal piece that I think uh, SSG have usually used to like, very well in games in the NAL, they couldn't translate that here, and that hurt a lot. So uh, for NIP, doing your homework, dude, MIDI, good stuff. Like, I'm happy that that was something that you decided to to bring in for this game because that did wreak havoc on SSG. Credit where credit is due, they did manage to keep the score close, but I think if they were able to play more into a comfortable strategy like that, they probably win. So that's just a testament to understanding how difficult international competition uh, is in a case like this. And this was Hot and Cold's best map overall. I think probably of the entire tournament he didn't he wasn't like a highlight or a standout we we talk about fault and rampy being the guys who would do it we talk about bosco being a clutch god like skies hardly got talked about this tournament because he just wasn't the flashiest guy in the world he didn't need to be but we, we were wondering where our stage three mvp was for the nal we thought he'd be a crazy fragger monster and he, he even tried like flexing back into his old sledge roll i think a little bit on coastline and even that still didn't work out yeah, I think those are two like really great points with the ban and with hot and cold. Um, the hot and cold, I think, dragged SSG to the finish line. Um, not that they quite got there, but uh, he's right. the reason why SSG even pushed this game to overtime. He had a fantastic performance, um, and it was really like a rock inside the lobby, always performing um, in each and every round. What does this cost overall? It might not be like crazy good. We've got we have a here if you want to look at it. Yeah, you know, yep. They they lost a lot of rounds, right? But still, I thought that he was a really um, solid player for SSG. And then those bans. The one ban that like I think was a mistake, um, looking back on Coastline, it might not have been a mistake in the moment, but I really think that my ban from SSG wasn't their greatest friend because it felt like yep. when NIP were holding, they were running like, you know, again, they were all over the place. I don't even know if they brought, I think they brought a Jaeger once, maybe twice. I think they brought a Jaeger twice. Rampy was using it, yeah. No, 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 NIP. NIP almost never brought a Jaeger, and it didn't feel oh, like freaking, they were yeah. running setups that were really 
uh, indicative to like utility dump will my play right like i don't look at any of nip's defenses and be like man uh, well my would really help them out there they were just playing too aggressively they were playing too offsite too roam heavy for that to really be a thing and then like we start the first defense of ssg it's a hookah setup and they're just like stacking with utility it's got a jaeger they're ready to like catch grenades as they come in from the hookah balcony and i think they lose a couple like one or two players yeah they lose some players to grenades and just like damn wish they had well my they banned it <laughs> right like I didn't see a single defense that like was missing a Wamai until it started to be SSG's turn uh, on that defense. So, you know, a minor thing, SSG did do quite well on their defense, so clearly it wasn't that big of a hindrance. Um, but I also don't think uh, clearly it had that big of an effect on NIP. So maybe there could have been something better to choose uh, to choose in that moment. In hindsight, the Oryx, I mean, maybe it would have been a better band because it was what NIP were running to love. Um, yeah, it's true. And yeah, the I, I want to give credit to the tack time out as well from NIP. I think it was called it a really good moment. SSG were starting to run away with it on defense, and uh, it seemed to turn things around for NIP. So, um, well done on that one. Uh, I know you, you you don't have the stats pulled up in front of you, but I did kind of want to pick your brain as the guy who always does the band phase segments for NAL games, like uh -huh. specifically for SSG. So let me know what you think of the phase overall. They ban Cafe to start. It's they ban Cafe. NIP bans Oregon. Then we have Chalet and Coastline get brought up into the mix. Then SSG ban Club. As NIP ban Bank, and we have Villa's Decider. What I the, my initial thought looking at this was SSG did not want to provide NIP with a freebie if they were reading very heavily into maps that SSG play super frequently, which makes sense because you don't want to give them an inherent advantage if they've been uh, scrimming on maps that you're comfortable with or they've been counter stratting or they've been VOD reviewing whatever it might be but ssg banning cafe and banning club was that a mistake i mean i don't think they lost this in the map ban phase i do you know that those bands are questionable cafe particularly they're six and one on um over the last two stages it's been very strong for them and two and oh over the last stage um mm -hmm. before this major now that doesn't include those stats don't include the group stage where they played it twice both times against furia a win and a loss came from those games both those games were really close and i imagine it was those two matches that really kind of drove ssg away from cafe whatever it was in those furia games i'm betting that ssg saw it and we're just like you know what furia almost destroyed us twice in a row on this map phase clan <laughs> or sorry nip are going to do what furia did even better so whether they saw something in, in Furious play that they just didn't think they could adapt to and handle in the short amount of time they have between groups and playoffs, or they saw something in their own game that was just like, this is a big you know, hole in our in our game that Fury are exploiting, and no doubt NIP saw that as well. Um, they decide it's too risky, they take it out. And then, um, yeah, was the second map that they banned again? Uh, so they, they banned Cafe and then Club, yeah. Clubhouse has been, I think, more sort of 50-50 for SSG over the last little while. Um, since the start of the year, since the start of Stage 1, they are 6-2. and two. Um, But since the start of Stage 2, which is what I you know, gave for their last map, um, they're 2-1. Yeah. and one. So a little bit shakier. Again, that doesn't come into play for... Uh, that doesn't include the group stage, which they did right. play twice against Damwon Kia. Lost at both sides. It really felt like these maps were... Uh, this map and phase was largely influenced by the results and the play that they had inside of group stage, which is good. I think their I think their map and phase really adapted between the two phases of the tournament. It just wasn't enough to pull out the win. All right. So there's two other things that I figure we could do before we wrap this post show up. The first thing is if we pull the bracket back up, we can do uh, some additional predictions talking about tomorrow and then maybe even a, a super early grand final call because good grief we're at a point where we only have three best of or three best of series left at the sweden major before we end up crowning a major champion and we have our matchup set so it's nip and rogue and face clan and dom one now according to the schedule they've done the same thing where they put the dom one game first so that apac fans have a little bit more of a an acceptable time in which to catch that game and it means that nip rogue will be the next one up so and these also start at around 10 to 10 30 eastern because like well we know that the majority of our audience is uh 
is American or at least North American. So that's where the Face Clan Dom Juan game starts, and then NIP Rogue is right after that. So it's not nearly as early of a day, which is fantastic given the <laughs> the sleep that I know both of us have lost covering this whole yep. event so far. But uh, NIP Rogue chat, I know you guys are going to have opinions about this. Yes, the grand final is a best of five without a map advantage given how this is going. So why don't we start? Left side of the bracket, and we'll touch on the game on the right first. NIP and Rogue. Jesse, what's your initial thought? Jacob, I have one rule, and it failed me in a third of the games uh, today, but I'm sticking with uh, it. I'll, I'll, I'll never bet against Europe? Close. Never bet against Latin America. Man! <laughs> NIP have got to be my pick for this one. You know, Rogue, I have doubted time and time again, and they've proved me wrong time and time again. So my dumb ass is going to doubt them again. I'm going NIP here. <laughs> you know, on paper, I just, I think Rogue is the weaker team. And although they've gone for a hell of a run, a hell of a run so far, they've kind of accomplished their goal, right? They made SI, they beat yeah. out the former major champions. You know, I think it's about time somebody stopped them. And in my opinion, it's probably going to be NIP. That's my mentality as well, even though I am very much risking a uh, a third Leon Gids ratio for always picking Rogue to never get out of groups. I love <laughs> Leon, but by that same token, I also still figure it, it, it's not even a matter of like, can you handle something like playoff pressure anymore? Because they did that. They beat the, the champs of Mexico, which is a worthwhile accomplishment in and of itself. And like you mentioned, they made SI already because of that, because of the game today. I, I look at this NIP team and it's not even necessarily that they uh, beat uh, Space Station in as dramatic a fashion as they did, but to me, NIP look as though they're back in form. And if they're capable of winning that game against Space Station as handily as they did in a, in in 2-0 fashion, I think there's a chance that they end up do like they go back to grand finals. And this was honestly something that I figured was kind of interchangeable, regardless of whether it was going to be NIP or Team One getting out of the semifinals. I do still think we're looking at the potential for an all Latin American grand final, similar to what we had for SI, simply because of how well that region is able to pace itself. And Rogue being the number two seed out of their group and somebody who we didn't have expectations for coming into this tournament, like I lean towards NIP just inherently. Rogue did really good. If, if you lose this game, like there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I think your journey ends here. Yep. And then the second game, Jacob, I'll keep it quick. My my motto, you know it, we're not betting against the green. FaZe Clan again, <laughs> right? I mean, Damwon Kia. Yep. I, I am so hyped for a Damwon Kia NIP rematch. That is the rivalry I never knew I needed, but I need it. Um, and so if, if that's at all possible, Siege Gods, I'm praying to you. You already took TSM at SI away from me. Give me damn on Kia versus NIP <laughs> in the finals. I think it's going to be FaZe. I think they're just too good. I think they're going to win the entire tournament. But yep. if Mexico got to be a good tournament, I think the only way Mexico could be toppled as like a crazy good underdog story is if damn on Kia were able to come in and be NIP in the finals. I don't think it's going to happen, but Jacob, God, I wish it does. I very much hope that we end up uh, going all the way down to the, uh, the uh, best of five or map five if it's damn one versus NIP and map five is clubhouse just so the entire storyline from Mexico comes full circle. Uh, yeah, Siege Gods, if you're listening, that would be ideal. I don't even care who wins at that point. Like, admittedly, I would still want damn one for the, the Cinderella story, but it would still Come be on. crazy if NIP overcame their demons. Like, there's still a storyline to that and it's still sure. cool. Um, but I am in the same camp. I will still take phase in this game, mostly due to just how formidable these guys are and i do think that phase against da Dam one is a, a case where even though Dam one have faced latin american teams before phase is a completely different beast they've played uh remind me they've played furia and they've played nip and they've had relative success against both of them i think they're like three and one against latin american teams and i think they might have lost one game to furia but that would have been it um i'm trying to remember what the what their group stage like, looked like in offhand. this event in this event, did they lose to Fury at all in the best of one? For Damwon Kia, no. Fury had like, wait, did they? No, no, no. They did in a meaningless best of one, and one that didn't matter because they had already. Or was it meaningless? No, that wasn't me. Well, I'm trying to remember. No, it wasn't meaningless. They did lose in an overtime best of one to Fury on Clubhouse. Um, yeah. Well, I'll still take Phase in that game, uh, and then whatever ends up happening in the Grand Final happens in the Grand Final. So that's the bracket. I know, chat, you probably have some some different opinions about that, and please feel free to let us know how right or how wrong we are in chat or in the YouTube comments if that's where you're watching this. 
Yes. Uh, but before we wrap up, I did also want to mention one thing. Uh, it's it's not very often that I think talent really talks about talent very much, mostly because I think we don't ever want to risk the idea of like pitting people who work on broadcast against one another. But this is a wholeheartedly supportive message to both Pengu and Bikini Body. What you guys have managed to do for this major has thoroughly impressed me and blown my expectations away. Regardless of where those expectations sat before this major began, I am impossibly proud of the effort that both of you have put into trying to turn this from your first ever international event in a broadcast capacity into something that you can hopefully like show to people down the road is, hey, I worked a major and I was really proud of that performance. You absolutely should be because what you've done is something I think a lot of people probably didn't think you'd be able to do that well. It's like, Bikini, you're a content creator. No one thought you'd be that solid. It's like, even if the start was rocky, you got those kinks ironed out as the day went on. And I'm, I I think you really should be proud of that. And Nick, I'm sorry you have to endure a casting with Parker. That is a, a fate I would wish on no man. And I'm sorry Michael had to endure it for so long. But still, you, you both did really good today. Yeah, absolutely. Like they they crushed it for the first land, and the rest of talent did as well. I thought Fluke and Hap really blew it out of the water um, today in those two games yeah. that they were able to do. Um, you know, Parker for everything that he's been through, absolutely nailed it. You couldn't tell that anything had happened, um, and he's been he's been crushing it all event long. John um, went full rap god in that one game. Yeah, ace. dude. Blue's been crushing it. Um, ace and Dez are good too, I guess. I don't know, Brits, whatever. Um, <laughs> and especially I want to give a shout out to production because holy shit, and the stage they got going on, the transitions they got going on, a lot of the graphics that they're producing, I think it's all been fantastic. So yeah, um, amazing show so far from, uh, from the whole team that's put on the Mexico or Mexico, the Sweden major, <laughs> Jacob, they've been, uh, I do that too still. Yeah. They've been doing very well. The, the thing that made me really, really miss out on not being there which is like com not even related to production was the media day pictures that they did for yesterday and showing like crying and yeah. Leon with the, with, with a really big fur coat and the sword, like, Oh my God, I want pictures like that. That's so sick. Those pics were so cool, dude. Like not only did they yeah. get like all the, all the action shots with like around the fire and everything, but they were dressing up in costumes. They did all those cool interviews where like they made the players freeze out in the cold watching SSG, <laughs> just like trembling as they answer their interview questions. Yeah. Gold amazing love that <laughs> we should do it in montreal too uh i emoji let's let's what? let's do that in montreal and hell just yeah dude shove them out in the cold dude i i i fell on my ass in montreal because you you guys don't pave your stairways in canada which is really stupid or um, maybe it's just Some a montreal stairways. thing do you do it in alberta <laughs> hey man, what do you mean pave our stairways like it depends on the stairway most, well, you, you just didn't clear them. That and your sidewalks too. I think in the U.S. it's like mandatory that you have to clear your sidewalks oh, if there's a like thing a, a crazy Canada ton of snow well. on it. But they just, you know, hey, it, it the wasn't a thing. Storm. It wasn't a thing at SI two years ago. All, all I have is that one memory. <laughs> all Indeed. right. That can um, be where we wrap things up for today, though. Unless you got anything else you want to. I do, uh, Jacob. Void. I do because there's a prediction competition going on in the Jesse J. Yes, Chish Big Brain Club BBC Discord um and so if bbc I can, oh dear god the big brain club jacob and so if i can uh, if i can announce some winners so for those who don't it's know been, i didn't click that it was a bbc acronym until just now christ for those who don't know what we're doing that's what doing valley watch has parties every day <laughs> every day we do watch parties um and we also do a prediction competition you can jump in the discord uh you can you can play along <laughs> we're doing an overall competition and we do daily competitions if you win the overall competition, you get um, you get a free esports jersey of your choosing. Um, and if you win the daily competition each day, you'll get a free Valkyrie esports skin code. Two of two of the competitors today, Jacob, got perfect on the day. Out Ooh. of one hundred and thirty nine people that ended up playing in today's competition, those two players were Czar Kyle and Doctor Mango Trump. I flipped the coin to see who gets the skin code, and Kyle ended up coming out on top. So congratulations, Kyle. Um, I believe he said in the Discord he picked Rogue over um, over Team One because he liked their League of Legends team. So nuts <laughs> predictions coming out from Kyle. I'll be in your DMs. Didn't they get group staged at Worlds though? Like yeah, this is yeah, they did. But like either way, he did well. Um, and for Dr. Mango Trump, it's not all bad news because in the overall standings, he's actually alone 
in first place going for the jersey. We still have two more days. Plenty of people could catch up still, um, but he sits in first place. Ash Luz is right behind with 42 correct points. Rody, social media manager for R6 Esports NA, is in third at 38 points. And then we've got Wing slash uh, an MK tied for fourth. Boxy, Flynn, and Mouse are all tied for sixth. And I believe that is the entire list of people that can um, possibly get first at this point. Only eight people still in the race to get the free esports jersey. And unfortunately, one of them is Flynn. And he's probably going to make me get him like an old, like 1970s NHL jersey from like some rookie that nobody's heard of. So, yeah, because you didn't make it specific to like uh, I just the, the esports specific. Jersey. It could be whatever. <laughs> he's going to make me get like a $900 like antique from Amazon. It's like, that's not fair. Does he already own a Gretzky jersey? Like, are you truly an, an, an NHL fan if you don't have a vintage Gretzky jersey okay. in your closet someplace? Gretzky is pretty basic shit, Jacob. This guy's got, I like... Say, I say that as somebody who has a Manning jersey sitting in his closet as, as an All NFL right. fanatic. So, like, All right. you got to have one legend in there someplace. I suppose. <laughs> All right, Flynn, uh, half of me wants you to win that jersey, and the other half of me doesn't want you to win anything. I'm just, just, you got fired for a reason. Your name shouldn't pop back up anymore. I'm kidding. Love you, buddy. Well, All right. Anything else you want to touch on, or is that kind of it? I think we're done. I think that's going to be uh, I think that's gonna be it, Jacob. I think that's all that I wanted to touch on. I'm going to spam my Discord link uh, in the chat so do you can it. wrap up while I do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess outro monologue time. Thank you guys for showing up for day four of the post show. It'll be the same idea for tomorrow. Even if the timing of the matches is different, we should still be good to go at relatively the same time frame. The schedule for tomorrow, like we mentioned before, around 1030 or so Eastern is when that first game starts. And then it is a running schedule. So the second semifinal will begin right after the first one is done. We start off with Damon, Kia and Face Clan, and then we move immediately into Rogue and NIP. One of them will be your six Sweden major champions. We'll get into a little bit more uh, detailed analysis and stuff tomorrow as we've been this entire time. Thank you guys for showing up for this episode and uh, pretty, pretty, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's up. Bye. Nailed it.